And we're going to go back now. We've been in the Gospel of John. We finished with John chapter 4. And I said we'd take some time and go back into the Psalms. And I'd like to preach to you this morning from Psalm 11. I preached 1 through 10 oh, a while ago. We spent a little bit of time now in the Gospel of John. We're going back to the Gospel of John after some Psalms here. I know Evan is going to do a little bit of preaching here the next maybe three weeks coming. I'm going to do a resurrection sermon. Uh, Evan's going to preach a few sermons uh, to give me a little bit of a, a break. I, I need to spend some time studying more and I need to spend some time with that woman over there. <laughs> hey, Amy. <do> I, oh. <laughs> I'm getting in big trouble here. <laughs> that specific woman over there. <laughs> we desperately need to do that. But let's go to Psalm 11. By way of a title, you can see it there. Faith in the Council of Fear. Faith in the Council of Fear. I believe that's somewhat what is going on here in the richness in this psalm of what David does as he lays hold of the glory of God and the sovereignty of God is something that I'm quite certain we can glean from with the Spirit's help. So Psalm 11, verse 1. <clears throat> this is... To the chief musician, a psalm of David. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may secretly shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the children of men. The Lord testeth the righteous, but the wicked, and him who loves violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked shall rain snares of fire and brimstone, and horrible tempests. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. Before I preach, let's go once again to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing upon the preaching of His Word. Father, we come before You, Lord, in desperation. Lord, You, you are a God who has revealed Yourself through Your Word. And yet, Lord, we know that that revelation cannot be accepted, received, believed, trusted unless You do something unique and special within the heart and mind of a person. And ultimately, Lord, we know that that's causing them to be born again. And so, Father, I know that there are some of those people that are here this morning. You have done a mighty and a glorious work in revealing Yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit, bringing new birth, revealing Yourself through the Word, through Your Son, the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, You have quickened and given life, and for that we give You praise. But now, Lord, we even still need Your help to help us understand, that You might give us understanding, that You might open the eyes of our hearts, that You might enlighten our minds and our thoughts to be able to take what is here and be renewed in the spirit of our mind and to marvel and worship you. Lord, that you might also give us faith to cling on to what is said here, faith to trust and believe you, to know that you are God and there is no other, that as we walk through this life on this planet, that we might do it in faith, serving you, bringing honor to you, bringing glory to you. And Lord, that we might live triumphantly, that we might live victoriously, that we might recognize that there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, and that might give us some kind of a testimony to a lost and broken world of how glorious you truly are. I pray that you would do that through this message. Pray also, Father, that you might save this morning. 
I have no doubt that there are those who are here that do not know you as Savior, Lord, and King. They have some kind of a faith, Lord, you know, because you don't need anyone to testify of man because you know exactly what's in man. So, Lord, if there's someone here who says, yes, Jesus is just a good guy, he's a great miracle worker, he can fulfill me with everything I need, but don't know him as Savior, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day that you would grant them repentance to the acknowledgement of their sins and that you might draw them to your Son for your own glory. Lord, be with my lips. If I say anything this morning that would have to deal with my opinion, then I ask that you would somehow, by your grace, strike it from the ears of your people. That you might have the preeminence, and that all the glory would go to you. I humbly ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Faith in the counsel of fear. Kenny Rogers, I was going to start this sermon a little weird, but... It'll, oh Lord willing it'll work out Kenny Rogers wrote a song called The Gambler and you, do you remember the chorus of that song you gotta know when to know when to know when to and know when to see you can remember the Bible <laughs> you remember Kenny Rogers right I can't remember the Bible. You remember the Bible. You remember Kenny Rogers. You can, you can do some work in the Bible. <laughs> Kenny Rogers, I like that song. It's called The Gambler. But, and before I started here, there, there's a reality where I want to... Sometimes you, you come to a passage of Scripture, you come to a sermon and, or, or a, a, a psalm especially, and you look at it and you say, well, here he's, he's running away. <laughs> here he's... He's, he's walking away. Here he's folded. He's just done. And then in a place like this, David is holding. He's, he's steadfast. He's got a really good hand. But we, we should know, we should be able to discern when we should hold them and fold them and walk away and when to run. You, you get that in these psalms. You, you get places where David is like, I'm out of here. I'm running into the mountains. I'm hiding. The armies are close. They're coming near, and they're going to kill me. There's no speaking any kind of communication into the ears of this person. They're going to kill me, and I got to run. Places all over the Bible in the New Testament, Jesus even tells us in the Gospels, there's going to come a time when you'll have to flee. <laughs> you read the book of First and Second Peter, and there's the elect that are scattered abroad. They had to scatter. They had to flee. They had to run. They couldn't hold them. Nero was dipping them in tar and lighting the city of Rome with their bodies. You have to know when to hold them. You have to know when to fold them. You have to know when to walk away. And you have to know when to run. In this psalm, David is holding. He's got a really good hand. All bets are in and he's betting high. The other thing that I'd like to say before I really get into these words is the psalms are full of emotion. They're full. Every emotion that you will ever experience, every emotion that you can possibly think of or go through or feel, you can read about in the Psalms. Now, I, I like that because when it comes to emotion, we have to be extremely careful. Why? Because emotion shouldn't drive us. We need to learn to drive the emotion. Some people just want to take emotion and throw them in the garbage. Oh, you're afraid. Fear shouldn't be something you have. That's an emotion you're fearing because you're not trusting in God. Just get rid of it. No, God has created us with emotions. Praise His name. Thank God that I can feel joy and, and peace and that I can go through. Even fear is a healthy thing sometimes, isn't it? All right? I have a roof to do pretty soon. I'm afraid to do it. That fear will keep me alive. <laughs> <laughs> in a sense in a sense I'm not going to do something stupid uh, crawl up on that steep roof without having protection underneath me something when I slide and fall I'm going to be able to catch my foot against a plank or whatever it is roof jacks whatever but I'm not just going to go up there and start shoveling shingles off of a steep pitched roof I, I'm afraid fear can be a good thing 
emotions are good things. The problem is, is what oftentimes happen is we begin to experience emotions and we allow the emotion to drive us and steer us and put us in directions that we don't really need to be. You, truth and the knowledge of God and the glory of who He is and what He, what he has said and what He has done should help drive and steer our emotions. And so say if someone says something a little off color to me, may not even be wrong, and I get angry. So it's okay to walk up to that person and punch them in the face. No, that's letting the emotion of anger control your actions. Your, 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 the truth of who God is, what He said and what He has done should be renew us in the spirit of our minds and be able to say, I can be angry, but I don't have to sin in and through that anger. You may have an anxiety. We all, I get a kick out of people who sort of crucify people who struggle with anxieties. I used to be one of them. Anxiety is a sin. Be anxious for nothing. The Bible says that you shouldn't be anxious. You're just not following God. You're not, you're not believing the right way. Well, the reality of your anxiety you should be able to take that emotion, that feeling, that struggle that's within you, and that anxiety should lead you to the truth where you say, wait a minute, anxiety, I'm going to get a hold of you, and you and I are going to go to Jesus, and we're going to get straightened out. You're not going to control me. I'm going to take every thought captive and bring it unto Christ, and He's going to tell me exactly how I should live in the light of all of these emotions. But oftentimes what happens is we let the emotion drive our thinking. And then as a man thinks, so he is. And so if you have all kinds of fear and you're struggling with that emotion, you're going to live in a way that, oh, I, I can't do that. And, oh, you, you shouldn't ride motorcycles because you'll crash and you can get hurt and die. And Don't go play baseball, little Johnny, because someone's going to hit a ball and it's going to come flying through a, what do they call that, a, when a ball just goes straight across and hits somebody, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, line drive. Don't do, we can live in we can live in fear like that. Emotions they're they're all over and in the Psalms, and, and so don't don't just take emotions and say ah oh, you're just not being faithful. No, no, you need to get control of those emotions by biblical truth and the majesty and glory of God and have them controlled by truth rather than having the emotion drive you wherever it wants to. And we see that in the Psalms. Sometimes you see David, especially, it's like, man, he's, he's living out of the emotion of fear. But, but then what happens? But when I looked at God, oh, it melted away. We studied Psalm 73 last Monday at my house, Asaph. Asaph said, I, I'd become like a beast. I was looking at the world and they, they prosper and they have all kinds of money in their pocket and they beat up the wicked. It doesn't seem like any judgment comes and it seems like living righteous is for nothing. And he says, oh, but when I walked into the temple of the living God, then... Then I got my mind straightened out. Then I began to realize I was like a beast before God, thinking like, like just some kind of an animal. Their end is sure, as well as the end of the righteous is sure, isn't it? We have to have our thinking right. Don't be driven by emotion. I had to say those two things because I'm going to say some things from this psalm that I believe this psalm says that we have to be careful that we don't take, take this psalm, rip it out of the Bible and say, See? This is the be-all and end-all. We're going to pin this above everything and interpret the Bible in light of all of this says here. There's things that we have to be careful of. This is the case here, but this may not be the case back here. <clears throat> and so here David is. Apparently, he's receiving counsel from people which causes him to give the report, the proclamation of, verse 1, in the Lord put I my trust. In the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, in the Lord, in Jehovah, I put my trust. Who is Jehovah? What does Jehovah mean? I put my trust in the self-existing one. 
That's who I trust in. And if he's self-existing, if he himself doesn't need or isn't contingent upon anything else causing him to exist, then everything else exists because of his existence. He's someone you can trust, right? David's got this right. He's thinking it through. I put my trust in the Lord, the self-existing one, the one that does whatsoever pleases him, the one who does nothing that's not according to the counsel of his own will, the one who has whatsoever comes to pass, comes to pass. It's the Lord. It's Jehovah. It's our God. He's the self-existing one. And David says, I'm trusting him. How or why would you say to me, flee as a bird to your mountain when I'm trusting him as my God? What kind of counsel is that? You better run away. You better get going. And this could be a time when Saul was chasing after David where David had finally come to the conclusions and the understanding in his growth through all of that fleeing and all of that running, where finally he realizes, you know what? The self-existing one has been faithful to me all the time. He has never let me down. Why do I have to fear now? You think of a man like David and what the Lord had done for him and through him. You go out there protecting the sheep and a lion comes along. <laughs> and, and, and we got to think this right. David is not a man who's puffing himself up. It's I'm so full of faith and strong in faith that I'm going to go out there and just take care. It's not the case at all. What he recognizes and realizes is not the strength of himself, but the power and the strength and the majesty of who his God is. That's the key. David isn't saying, I'm, I'm strong David. David is saying, I'm weak David, but I serve a very powerful God. That's, that's a big difference. So don't think of David like that. We come to passages of Scripture like the bear and the lion. And what does David do? God's, God's the one who's in control here. He's the one who's the, the, the sustainer of my life. He's the one who gave it to me. He's the one who's going to see it through. So I have no problem whatsoever taking a lion by the mane, slapping him around a little bit, and telling him to get out of here. Simply amazing. Or when there's a nine or ten foot giant down there in the valley spewing out all kinds of insults against the children of God, the people of God, the chosen of God, Israel, and all of the people in the army are shaking, they're clanging together, they're, oh, what are we going to do about this Goliath of Gath? And little David walks up and says, God's bigger than that giant. The story of David and Goliath isn't about a small man and a big man. The story of David and Goliath is about a puny giant and a big God. Big difference. David knew that. David understood that. David isn't going, oh, God, I'm, I'm going to be the one who slays the giant. No, you, Lord, you got to get rid of this clown. You, 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 have to do, you have to deliver him. You have to deliver your people from this guy. Listen to what he's saying, Lord. This is a slander against you, the holy God of Israel. And so God defeats the giant. It's all over the Bible. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you, you, you guys are going to pray, then you're going to pray to the idol that I raise up. And when you hear the blast of the horn, that's when everybody turns, faces the idol, and worships. And they say, can't do it. Heat up the furnace. Heat up the furnace. Don't you guys realize I'm going to burn you? I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. We understand you're very religious and you want us to really do this, but we trust in the living God. You're going to throw us in the fire and we believe that our God can protect us from the fire. But even if he doesn't, it's better to obey him than to worship your idol. Throw him in the fire. 
heat it up hot. Wait a second. There's a fourth man in the fire. They come out of the fire and their clothes don't even smell like smoke. They're holding, aren't they? They know something about the majesty and sovereignty of God. You can't pray. If you're going to pray, you pray to the idol that Nebuchadnezzar rule raised up. So Daniel, what does he do? Prays three times a day, faithfully, with his doors and windows open. He ain't hiding nothing. Of course, there's some scoundrels there, and they bring it to the king's attention. They say, hey, we found Daniel praying. You said if anybody's praying to any other gods that they're going to have to suffer for it, pay for it. It hurt the king because he had a favor towards him. But he ends up in what? The lion's den. I don't know about you, but if you were taking me to a lion's den, <laughs> it, 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 it's going to be bad as far as the fear. In the, I, I wouldn't want to go to a lion's den. They throw him in the lion's den, and I can't imagine the emotion that he was feeling then as well as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as well as David. Can you imagine? But there's something in that den when he falls to his knees and communes with the living God. Who do you think's in control of a lion's mouth? God says, I am and I can shut their mouths. I can make them like kittens before you. That's exactly what he does. Show up the next morning and they take the stone off the lid. Daniel, are you in there? Did your God deliver you from the mouth of the lions? Yes, my king, my God delivered me from the mouth of the lions. He has shut the mouth of the lions. Why would I run away? Why should I flee to the mountains? Well, they tell him why. In verse 2. Well, because, lo, the, the wicked bend their bow. They, they make ready their arrow upon the string that they might secretly shoot at the upright in heart. That's why you should run. You got, that's why you should get out of here. It's almost like in our time, we would say, someone has a gun pointed at you. You're in the crosshairs. Like, like get, run away. Serpentine pattern, you know? Make it, make it a harder target to hit. That's what they're saying to David. They got their bow. The arrow is notched. They got the bow drawn back. They're ready to shoot at you. You have to flee. They're shooting at the upright in heart. Not only that, but also, verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? It's an interesting verse, isn't it? The foundations. What foundations? The foundations of the world as far as the rule and the order, the government of man upon the earth that, that, that is here as well as here in our day, it's, it's destroyed. Well, what can the righteous do? You see their counsel? They're shaking in their boots. And David, a lot of this artillery is being aimed at you. You have to run to the mountain. David says, oh no. I trust in the Lord. I serve the self-existing one. I serve a God who's in control of when the arrow is released from the archer's bow. He tells it where it ought to hit. Is God in control of everything? There ain't a drop of rain that falls from the sky that doesn't have its destination ordained by God. He's in control of everything. David knows that. David knows that. But, but it's, such a, it's such a wicked place. It's such a wicked government. Saul has been trying to kill you for a long time now, and maybe this point it seems he's going to succeed. You've got to run away. Why would you make yourself present? Because I'm trusting in the living God. But the foundations are destroyed. This could be front page news of our day right here and right now, couldn't it? What, what can the righteous do? They legalize the use of drugs. 
they legalize same-sex marriages. The, 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 the culture in which we live and the world in which we live, the Bible is right. Evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse. It's not getting better and better. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Sodom and Gomorrah was known for that kind of stuff. Wickedness and ugliness and the sin, the sexual immorality that happened there. And that was kind of a taboo thing with the other surrounding nations. They, that, that's a bad place. You may not want to go in there. But now what we want to do is say what? It's legal. Yeah, we're going to agree. We're going we're gonna to define that as marriage. Oh, my goodness. The foundations are crumbling. What can the righteous do? I guess we should just give up, right? I said that David's not going to take the advice of their fear. He's not going to do that. I think it's kind of interesting, if you would, David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you remember Peter. Christ starts talking about, I got go to the, I gotta get to the cross. I, I have to be crucified. My blood has to be spilt. I'm here to purchase redemption, salvation for my people. And in order to do that, I have to die. And what does Peter do? <laughs> no, not so, Lord. That, that, that's not going to be your portion. We, we need to run. <laughs> we, we need to get out of here. What does Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. As Jesus, Luke 13, I got to study this passage of Scripture more, but the Pharisees come to Jesus and said, you better get out of here. Herod's seeking to kill you. You know what Jesus says to him? Go tell that fox what I do. These are exact words. You go tell that fox what I do. The blind see. The lame walk. You go tell him. <laughs> he ain't afraid. You tell me to run away? I'm holding. Isn't that amazing? Right before Lazarus, when, they go, when Jesus is going to go raise Lazarus from the dead, you remember the disciples, how they, what they tell him there? Lord, didn't the Jews of late seek to kill thee there? I must work the works while it is still day. <laughs> of course they tried to kill me there. We're going back. I got to bring life to a dead man. I'm going back. And they try and they try and they try and they try to trick him. They try to, to, to accuse him. They try to slander him over and over and over and over again. Jesus doesn't run away. But he commits himself to him who judges righteously. That's what Peter says even when he was on the cross. You mess around, you're going to end up crucified down there. I ain't messing around and I want to be crucified down there. I'm willing to be crucified down there. That is exactly what needs to happen in order for my people to be set free and to be reconciled to my Father. I need to die down there. Let's go and die. Triumphantly. We don't live like that. That's, that's what trust in the Almighty looks like. You want to paint a picture of faith in God? That's what it looks like. This world isn't a friend to us. And yet we shouldn't fear what it has to offer for us when we live righteously. Righteously couple of men here from the 1600s. <clears throat> Amy was actually doing a study on the Beatitudes with you ladies, so this might be a little bit repetitious for you, but it's quite amazing. This is what faith in God look like, looks like in the face of a time where you should be, you would think you should be running away. George Roper came to the stake leaping for joy and hugged the stake he was to be burned at like a friend. Dr. Taylor leapt and danced a little as he came to his execution saying when asked how he was, well, God be praised, good master sheriff, never better, for now I am almost home.
I am even at my father's house, ready to be burned at the stake. And that's what he says. Lawrence Saunders, who with a smiling face, embraced the stake of his execution and kissed it, saying, Welcome, the cross of Christ. Welcome, everlasting life. All because they didn't run away. They stood. They trusted in their God. Brothers and sisters, what's the worst that can happen to us? <laughs> what's the worst that can happen to us? Well, 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 well we could die. For me, to live is Christ, and to die is what? Gain. What does death really do to me when I serve Him? When He has done all that He has done, why should I fear death? It's gain. What's the worst that can happen? Oh, well, we lose some members of the church. We don't build a building. What's the worst that can happen? God is in control, is he not? That, that's the mentality David has here. I'm not running anymore. I know the Lord. I put my trust in the Lord. I have faith in the Lord. I know it's pretty wicked. I know it's really bad. I know the foundation seems as though they're destroyed. But you say, what can the righteous do? I say, what, what can't the righteous do? That's, that's what David's going to answer. You want, you, you want to say, what can the righteous do? This is the answer he gives in verse 4. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. You see what David points back to? Who's really in control here? The self-existing one is on his throne in heaven, and it's a throne, isn't it? What does a throne signify? He rules. He reigns. He's on a throne. He's the king. He's the everlasting king. He's the self-existing king. And he determines what goes on down here. In other words, David has a very good settled this in his heart and in his mind of the reality that God is not some distant God that he doesn't see what's going on here he doesn't know what he's doing he, he's just too far away to see that the foundations are just being destroyed no God sees everything he rules and reigns from heaven David says you, you say what can we do what can't we do with this God who is for us? With this God who has entered into a relationship with me? He promised me. Promised me. He's not going to let me go. He's going to see it through. There's some things that God promised to David that must have filled his veins with fire. You're going to be a king, and I'll establish your kingdom forever. From God. Now, I know that's completely and entirely fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, but still, David, you hear that from God as a promise from God. How does that, how does that cause you to live? <laughs> control he's still in heaven he's still on his throne no one climbed up the ladder and threw him off as if they ever could love this verse his eyes behold his eyelids test the children of men it's interesting God is not distance he sees everything he, see, he is very connected to the universe. Truth be told, without him doing what he does and extending the grace that he does, even by means of a common way, the universe would just cease to exist. We would all perish and be gone. 
apart from His sovereign grace, His mercy, and His love? You think of, I don't want to get too crazy, but it just entered into my, think of how the, the planets are spinning and the orbits and, and the, how everything revolves around in the galaxy and gravity and how all of this, that, that's all put together by Him. And that all continues to be put together by Him. Don't think that God, oh, God's not listening. God doesn't know. He knows everything. And He sees everything. His eyes, His eyelids, behold, they, He tests the children of men. And there's a reality that that's all men. He's going to get in, and his last points, he's going to show you how this works out for the wicked and how this works out for the righteous. But he tests them. He tries them. And there's a reality that we would be able to say this to unbelievers, even this very day. God is trying you. God is testing you. God is looking down from heaven, making judgments and discernment, but bringing such grace into your life that it should cause you to see His goodness, to see His mercy, to see His care, and it should lead you to repent. That's what Paul writes in Romans, doesn't he? Go there real quick. Romans chapter 2. Verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them who do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? We'd be able to apply this to the unrighteous, what they're doing back in David in Psalm 11. Or, dis, or do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impentant in heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. Do you see what Paul is doing there? David's doing the same thing here. God is trying men. He looks down and behold his creation. He looks at the whole universe, the whole world of men, and God is trying them. And the reality for most of those men is that is just leading into or filling up the cup of wrath that God has who is that that's going to be poured out upon them. That's what Romans 2 is saying. Drip by drip by drip, by drip. Are you seriously building up wrath against the day of wrath? That's what, Paul, that's what Paul's writing. Here God is being gracious. Here God has, even by means of creation, revealed himself to you in such a way that should cause you to say, who is this God and how can I know him? And yet look what you do to God's people and to the righteous you got your arrow knocked. You got your bow drawn back. You want to kill those who are righteous? Don't you realize how patient God has been with you? Don't you realize how gracious and long suffering He's been with you? You should repent and believe on Him. There's a reality where I've been waking up every morning, almost, <laughs> every morning. And I scratch my head and wonder, why do you keep doing what you do? Why did that ball of fire come up again in the east like it does every morning? Because we're, we're worthy of your judgment. We're worthy of you bringing judgment upon us, even in 
the last judgment, the times when, Lord, it, He can end it. And He doesn't. Don't you know that the patience and long-suffering of God should lead you to repent? That's why. He's still got some saving to do. Don't hinder that. <laughs> he tests the children of men. That doesn't mean just the lost or the wicked or the world in a sort of corporate way. Verse 5, the Lord testeth the righteous. But the wicked and him who loveth violence, his soul hates. They're hard words, aren't they? The Lord tests the righteous, and he tests the righteous in a totally different way than he does any other beings. We know from New Testament especially, we even can learn that from the Old Testament. There is a testing of God that purifies, isn't it? God said, I'm going to lead you through a wilderness for this long to clean you out of your sin. <laughs> you're going to walk through, you're going to grumble, you're going to murmur, and you're going to complain, and I'm going to show you who I am. And you're going to get it right. And I believe according to Romans chapter 10, 9, 10, and 11, Israel's going to still get it right. <laughs> he ain't giving up on them, and he ain't left them behind. But there's a reality that the testing of the righteous, God tests us daily. And we can look at multitudes of biblical Bible verses. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith is much more precious than that of gold or silver. We should have the mindset, especially coming out of a psalm like this, to say, Lord, test me. Try me. Try me as gold tried in the fire, Lord. Bur bur burn all the dross off me. Cleanse me of my sin, Lord. I have so much of it, and it's difficult prayer to pray, but Lord, turn the heat up, if you will, so that it could happen even faster, that I might be holy, that I might be conformed to the image of your Son, that I might be more like Him. Try me, Lord. Try me. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. See if there be any wicked way in me, Lord. That's how God tries the righteous. That's how He tests the righteous. But the wicked, and him who loveth violence, his soul hates. You're not going to hear these from this, this kind of language from many preachers. You may not like it. Truth be told, I don't like it. But it's what this book says, and I got to say it. Him who loves violence, his soul hates. Wow. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? It's a Bible verse. That's what the Bible teaches. The difficulty in that for our minds is we say, no, no, wait a minute. God loves everybody. How do you line Psalm 11 verse 5 up with John 3.16? Here God is hating, isn't he? But wait, John 3, 16 is for God so loved the world. God doesn't hate anybody. He, he loves everybody. You just got a big contradiction, don't you? There is a reality, beloved. We, we can say about God, God is what? Love. He is that. That's his nature. He's love. God is not hate. N the Bible never says it. God is love and God is hate. No, no, he, He's not. His hatred proceeds forth out of His justice. He has to hate unrighteous. He has to hate the ungodly. He has to hate 
sin or he wouldn't be just. This leaves the unbelievers and the unrighteous in a very ugly, terrible condition and position. And so what do we offer them to escape the righteous judgment and hatred of God? Well, we offer them the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone, where the love of God is manifested most clearly according to what the Bible teaches. You want to escape the wrath of God? Do you want to get out from underneath the righteous hatred and justice and judgment of God? Do you want to cease being his enemy? Would you like to have to be, to be reconciled to this self-existing one and come out from under his condemnation and the wrath that he's pouring out upon you? Would you like that to happen? Then you need to experience him in a relationship with him through what his son did. John 3.16 is just as true as Psalm 11, verse 5. The other difficult thing about talking about the hatred of God is we oftentimes think of God like us. And God specifically said in His Word, I am not like you at all. Oh, you have hatred. I have hatred, but I don't hate like God hates. God's hatred is a pure, perfect, righteous, just hatred. Not like mine. I hate because you did something to me that I didn't like and now I'm mad at you and so I hate you. Not like that. It's not how God does it. God is angry with the wicked every day. And yet he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But he's not going to stop being just, and he's not going to stop being love. Yeah, it's hard to line up, but it's true, isn't it? It should add to the weight of the wicked to recognize and realize in your condition and in your position, you're no friend of the living God. And the only way to become one is to be united to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shed His blood that we might be saved. Here's their, their end, their destruction. Verse 6, Upon the wicked He shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. That phrase, this shall be the portion of their cup. Fire and brimstone. You see, God's judgment and God's way of dealing with sin in the unrighteous is not annihilation, is it? We're not annihilationists. We don't say, well, you know, God's judgment is going to fall, and when you die, you die. You're dead. You're gone. You don't get to live forever in heaven. You just die. No. No. That's not what this teaches. You're not just simply annihilated. You're punished for an eternity. Snares, rain down snares, fire, brimstone, a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Jesus speaks about hell most often, doesn't he? There is a place where in which the unrighteous, the unbelievers, those who do not know God as their Savior, end up. And it is a place of eternal torment, eternal punishment, the eternal wrath and condemnation and judgment of God abiding on you. Why would you go to a place like that when you have someone who already drank the cup? It's their cup. That's the portion of their cup. The wrath of God is, is full. And if you don't know Christ, you have to drink the cup. But Jesus said, Lord, I'll drink the cup. And he drinks the full cup of the wrath of God to all the dregs of it. And he drinks every last drop of it, doesn't he? 
He takes every ounce of it on the cross of Calvary. God's wrath poured out upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And over and over again, Jesus says about that cup, Shall I not drink this cup that the Father gave me to drink? What is that cup? Father, if it possibly be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. What cup is that? It is the cup of the wrath of God that is poured out upon the sin. And Jesus takes the cup and he places it to his lips and he drinks it down, every bit of it. So that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My friend, if you don't know Christ this morning, I would beg of you and beseech and plead with you that you don't have to drink the cup of wrath, but that there was a substitute who stepped in and drank every drop of that for you. If you would simply repent of your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you would know and understand and see how glorious a Savior He is because He appeases, He propitiates the wrath of God and makes atonement for every one of your sins. For the righteous Lord, verse 7 in closing, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. He hates wicked. He hates it. His soul hates those who do violence. He, his soul hates the wicked. For the righteous Lord loves the righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. I don't know about you. And there's a part of me that wants to take that to a yet future thing. But there's a reality where these things are going on right here, right now. It's a present reality. I understand and know and believe, I know the Bible teaches there's a future judgment that is to come when the end is. And that's when God is really just going to make everything straight. New heavens, new earth, glory, glorified bodies, heaven. And there'll be no more wickedness there. There'll be no more unrighteousness there. But there is a reality where this is happening even as Psalm 11 states it, it's happening right now. God's countenance looks at the righteous. It's something He delights in. Think, think through this. Just, you're standing, you're in the presence of God all the time. What does He see? What does He see? Now, I don't want you to get too far out of whack here. Because there's something, something that we can say is like, well, I, I, I've read my Bible today and I've prayed and, and I, 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 I do a lot of ministry. I, I do this and I do this and I do that. I mean, I, I've, been, I've been a good boy. If God is seeing that, that, that proclamation of your self-righteousness, you, you're you're probably still in pretty big trouble with him. <laughs> or, or at least not right with him. But if he sees his son, if he sees his son, he's delighted. I can't, I can't understand that. <laughs> because I know the Bible is true. That if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we get His righteousness imputed to us. Paul says we can present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So if you're in Christ this morning, if you received Him as Lord and Savior, you, you, you've taken Jesus at His word and said, Lord, I believe. When God looks at you, He's delighted because He sees His Son. I'm not going to ask you to build heavy burdens up for you to go and do this, that, that. Just live out of that identity. That's all. 
Go live out of that identity. I'm a child of God. I've been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and now I'm going to live for God in that identity. I'm a child of the living God, and He's delighted with me because of what His Son did. Let that put iron in your veins. Let that be the guide and director of your life. Not, I've prayed, and I've studied, and I've preached, and I've witnessed, and I've testified, and I've, I've been to all kinds of, I lead all that. Just let it be Christ. Amen? Just let it be Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this psalm. Thank you for showing us your grace and your mercy and your love, but also, Lord, showing us your justice and your wrath and how, just how just you are. Lord, there's a part of us that would say, we yet still deserve what you're going to give to the wicked. And yet in light of what your Son has done upon Calvary's cross, we, we understand and receive that fullness of your grace that, that you can't punish us because you've already punished it in Him. And for that we give you praise. And Lord, you're not only just freeing us from that curse or that wrath, but you're also delivering us from the reality of the life in which we live to deserve it. So, Lord, continue this great work. I pray that you would continue, Lord, to be patient and long-suffering with the wicked, that you might continue to reveal, even through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you still stand with an outstretched arm, willing to save to the uttermost, that you might grant them repentance and call them to your Son. I pray that you would help us to do even that, for the glory of your own name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as we close with Jesus' calling?